Okay. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for another Scientists and Parks webinar. Today's topic is about presenting research at a professional conference. I have the esteemed pleasure of having all of the administrative partners for the Scientists and Parks program joining me today. So we have some folks from the EESA, me. We have folks from Geological Society of America, and we have a stewards person. So who am I? My name is Jessica Johnston. I am an education program coordinator with the Ecological Society of America. And I'm also the person who coordinates the Scientists and Parks professional development webinar series. In addition to me, I have two great folks along and I have one person on the backside doing technical. That's Matt Dawson. Matt, do you wanna say hi real quick? Hi, uh, yeah, just a quick hello, Matt Dawson. I'm the uh, Interim Assistant Director for the Center for Professional Excellence at the Geological Society of America, and it's good to see everybody today. Hi. Thanks, Matt. I swung that on him without notice. So, okay, Leslie, do you want to say hi next? Sure. Thanks, Jessica. Hi, my name is Leslie. I'm an Education and Outreach Program Coordinator for GSA at the Geological Society of America, and we um, partner with scientists and parks. And you might have uh, corresponded with me a little bit about your application in the past or about recruitment, and, um, and I'm always available to you for questions. Nice to meet you. And Sierra, how about you? Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm Sierra. I may be some of your uh, program coordinators, but um, I work for Conservation Legacy and under that the Stewards Individual Placements Program. Um, and yes, I work with the Scientists and Parks Program. And then just a heads up, we have sent out emails about it, even if I'm not your program coordinator, but stewards um, is working to just provide more training along with our partners to just help everybody feel like they're getting what they need. Um, and we started our Beyond Stewards training series. Our next one will be August 3rd with a um, program coordinator from the East. Um, and his name is JM and he will be doing it on neurodiversity. Um, the Zoom link is here. Uh, you'll also get a reminder email from your PC. Great, thanks Sierra for highlighting that event and um, kind of in the vein of what we're speaking about today and the interest that you've all shown in presenting at professional conferences, I wanted to highlight some events that are relevant to folks who've participated in scientists and parks and one of those is that um, we have an annual event at GSA called GSA Connects, it's being hosted this year in October. And um, we host uh, networking events for um, SIP alumni at that, that conference, actually. So um, if you're interested, feel free to join us for that conference and attend the New Terrains Networking Event and Alumni Reception. That conference will take place in Denver, Colorado. And there's a hyperlink on this slide that will um, link you to the meeting information. But um, if you're also interested in presenting at other conferences in the future and seeking to submit an abstract to one, we also have section meetings at GSA that are hosted in the spring. From March to May, and this might be an ideal time frame after your SIP project has completed and you're looking for uh, a venue to highlight your, your work. Um, there's a, a list of about five locations on the right hand of the slide where we host geographically organized section meetings. So there might be one close to you. And if you're interested in um, presenting, you, we have a, an abstract submission window that um, closes in October and December for those. And there's a link on the website where you can learn more information about geographic section meetings. Thanks for sharing the information, Sierra and Leslie. And in addition to that, uh, we also have, you know, the ESA annual meeting conference that's held every year in early August, sometimes first week, sometimes the second week. This year, we decided to go for the third week. Who knows, but in two weeks, we'll have an annual meeting up in Montreal, Canada. If you're not already coming, it's probably a little too late to promote that one. But so I wanted to get you thinking ahead to 2023. And we're going to be in Portland, Oregon. We offer contributed talks and posters and the abstracts are usually due early March. So if you're one of those year-long SIPers, um, you have plenty of time to get your abstract together. And I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't tell you about our SIP webinar that's coming up. That's our alumni mixer. So we've invited some people from our past cohorts um, that join us and talk about their lives, where they've gone, how the internship molded their careers. And um, we hope you can join and have a casual conversation. 
I'll drop the registration link in the chat momentarily, but first I want to kind of go over the webinar guidelines for today. Obviously, you all are a great group. You've always been very respectful, but I just want to make sure that everybody is intentional about making sure everybody feels safe in the room. This is an informal q and I encourage you to actually ask questions throughout the presentation, get to know your guest host, get to know your participants. Um, if you want to join the conversation verbally, you're more than welcome to. We just ask you to raise your hand and then we will call on you to unmute your mic. But if you are not talking, we ask you to keep your mic muted the entire time so that we don't have that crazy feedback. Again, post your comments or questions in the chat box throughout any time of this. And the rec recording, the event is being recorded today. So we have an action-packed agenda. There's a lot of things that go into making great presentations at professional conferences. So I will, we will try to get through everything, but this is what we hope to address. Presentation types of professional conferences, how you write a good abstract, one that you want to get accepted. What is the function of a good title? What makes a presentation great? Great, and we're gonna look at both the slide deck component or the poster component. Uh, last but not least, what makes a great presenter? And then we'll go into Q&A, but of course you can ask questions in the chat box at any time. Without further ado, I'm gonna kick it over to Leslie. Thanks, Jessica. And um, as you're thinking about presenting at a professional conference, I know our audience today, there's some of you who have done this and some of you who are learning about how to do this. And I wanted to highlight the different types of presentations that you might encounter if you, at you attend a professional conference. And um, mainly what happens at a professional conference is that there are these special sessions that are designed and put forth by the greater STEM community to enhance their technical learning and collaboration across the field. And so you, what you'd be able to do is submit your work to present in a session. And there's different ways that you can choose to present within a session. One of the most common types is an oral presentation. So in this, in this mode of presenting, what would typically happen is that you would be asked to give a 10 to 15 minute pre presentation that's an oral talk. Um, at GSA, I can speak to that example. Uh, we have 12 minute presentations and then we give three minutes to presenters to help answer their questions. Um, and there's usually a, typically a single presenter who will present on a particular subject or topic. Um, but I wanted to also emphasize that, especially for our um, SIP alumni events and, and sessions that we host for you at our conference, um, we do encourage co-presenting. So if you're uh, an SIP who's working with someone else on site, it is an option for you to also co-present. And typically in this scenario, you've got a visual aid that's a PowerPoint, but I've also seen people design really great presentations and other web-based apps like Canva or Prezi. Um, and so those are kind of tools that you might seek to use to craft uh, a nice oral talk. Another pathway to presenting at a professional conference would also be to present a poster. And typically what that venue looks like is that you've got um, kind of a different audience. It's more, it's more of a general crowd that's flowing in and out of the, um, the, the session that you're presenting in. And they might have uh, some awareness of the types of work or research that you're involved in, maybe even some technical knowledge of it, but you also might be speaking to a more general audience who needs some background in what you do. So typically it's nice to have an elevator pitch ready for this type of presentation where you can quickly highlight the significance of your research. So um, journalists typically, when they're trying to present a topic quickly, they focus on the who, what, when, where, why. And I kind of, kind of adapt that strategy for the poster session strategy as well, where you kind of cover the major aspects of your work very quickly for people and then invite them to have further discussion about your research and use your visual aid, in this case, a poster um, that you print to talk through the details of your work. And typically people will talk to you about five minutes or sometimes you'll get somebody who's really interested and you will end up talking to them about 15 minutes and it's, it's really cool. Um, professional conferences, I wanted to just recognize are also highly attended by your peers. So like in the case of GSA conferences, about 65% of the attendees are students and early career professionals and about 30 to 40% are professionals. So if you're thinking about what types of material you wanna talk about and who your audience would be, those type of numbers might help you kind of uh, identify what your audience is like and who you're speaking with. Another mode that I wanted to just highlight really quickly is networking. Um, and 
basically this is just uh, it's it's a way that you can present what you do and who you are at the meeting without necessarily taking advantage of those two official types of presenting. Um, and in that case, you would also would love to have an elevator pitch ready. And you want to focus on who you are, what you do, and what you're looking for at the meeting because you just never know. You might be pleasantly surprised to find someone that has advice, helpful connections and might even have an interesting opportunity for you uh, based on what you share about your passion and experience. So I'm happy to move to the next slide and kind of talk about the next uh, agenda item, which is how to write a good abstract. Um, so your abstract is really kind of fundamental to shaping the concise summary of your research. And one of the things I wanted to debunk right away is a, a myth about um, what an abstract is. So it's very common for people to think that an abstract is just a synopsis of their completed work, but the two really aren't the same. And the difference really is that a synopsis can be very passive in terms of how it describes the details of a completed project, but an abstract is very intentional and how it's written to highlight the significance of your work. And an abstract, every sentence you should think is serving a function towards building towards the audience's understanding of the, that significance. So to give you an idea of how you might approach writing an abstract that will effectively convey the significance of your work, we could go to the next slide and I can give you some, what I kind of summarize as my five-step process for thinking through the content of your project and presenting it in a, a kind of a systematic way that builds towards really placing it in the broader context. So the first thing that you would love to do in writing an abstract is introduce your topic and its broader significance. So right away, what you would like to do here is to make sure that your audience knows and understands the so what of the work that you've completed. And um, you wanna make sure that it's, it's, it's addressed in a broad way where they can, if your project is technical, they can understand the broader impacts of the project. Then you wanna take like one to two sentences to explain what the previous work has been done in the area that you're focusing in for your, your project and specifically address the limitations of that previous work to help support what would be the rationale and relevance of the work that you carried out and are planning to discuss through the rest of your abstract and your project. And what this does, the function of this is that it really highlights the problem to the audience. And it helps them um, kind of get, begin to understand what questions you're going to be answering through the course of discussing your work. After you establish that and what the limitations have been of previous work, you're ready to move into the third phase of your abstract, which is really to summarize what your approach has been and to address um, how, you, how you were thinking about the underlying question and specifically what methods or perhaps data that you used to help address answering that question. And um, what is really intended by this third phase of the abstract writing is uh, to really highlight the approach that you what, what you wanted to, um, uh, what you intended to achieve and to accomplish the work, through the work that you were um, doing and to specifically make sure that it, it, it highlights how you're trying to fulfill the limitations of previous work. So now you're, you've presented why you're, uh, what the broader significance is, you've explained the limitations of past work and you, you've highlighted where you're going with your work. And now it's time to talk about kind of the outcomes and findings of that, that work that you've done. So you want to indicate any major findings that um, were addressed within the work and caused maybe the, the greater understanding of your question to be rethought or understand in a, in a more complete and uh, distilled way. And so, um, this kind of helps highlight what the major outcomes are of the work that you've done and sets you up for the final phase of the abstract writing, which is to describe the significance of the findings and the unique value and meaningfulness of your work in the broader context. So now you wanna take your findings and say, hey, this is what I noticed are the implications of what I found out. And I wanna let you know exactly how I think this is relevant to future work or broader impacts for the work that I've carried out. So um, if we could advance to the next slide, I think it's always, always helpful to see an example from your peers. So I wanted to highlight a really nice abstract that was written by an SIP fellow alumni named Hannah Bonner, who had presented at a meeting with us. 
And her, her project was based at Zion National Park and she focused on monitoring novel toxigenic cyanobacteria. And so this abstract, um, you'll, you'll probably receive resources after this presentation um, where you can really read through this abstract. And I would encourage you to just kind of look at how she applies the steps that we just talked about to writing for her work. Um, and uh, if you need any other examples, there's a kind of a wealth of abstracts that have been submitted by SIPs in the past, and we can always kind of help you um, align and take a look at examples from other people. And with that, I will pass it forward to the next presenter and um, we can move on to the next slide. So before we jump over to Sierra, I didn't, I wondered if anybody had any questions about what Leslie just covered. That was really um, an awesome overview of how you write an abstract. And I don't know if you know this, Leslie, but our like picture, like our picture at the beginning is Hannah Bonner. <laughs> so small world. We both obviously admire her work. Uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. So we'll, we'll press ahead to the next section about what is the function of a good title with Sierra. Are you raising your hand? Yeah. Yeah. Just before we move on, I just want to note um, for the conferences, you may need to submit an abstract before your fit your project is finished. Um, but in my experience, more in the academic world, it's actually more beneficial if you can to wait to write the abstract until you're finished with your project, um, just because. I think it lends to a flow in your abstract that matches the flow of your paper and the writing seems like it's it's coming from the same place. So just keep that in mind if you can. An abstract really, I think, is best done at the very end, along with your title. Good point. Good point. It all just depends on when those those pesky deadlines come up, right? <laughs> All right, Sarah, do you want to talk about what the function of a good title is? Yeah, so I'm just going to go over this really quick. Um, titles, although going over it really quick, are very important. Um, they are usually the first impression that you get to make on anybody that is showing up to your poster that will draw them in, especially when there's so many around you um, and you want to talk about your work and you want to be noticed. And then when you give an oral presentation, it's again, still that first impression type of situation. So a title should really be short, succinct, yet creative. Oh, so yes, simple, surprising, <laughs> concrete, and creative. Um, so the the, I would say of all of these, keep it simple. Some folks can definitely get long-winded and they want to basically explain everything that's in their paper in their title, but that's not the function of it. It's just supposed to be like, grab them and go. Um, for example, we're gonna get into it a little bit later, um, but the title for, um, the poster that I'm going to show you as an example um, is called Bridging the Gap, an Outdoor Education Model Policy Proposal. Um, I personally like to um, sort of give something that's creative at the beginning and then explain secondarily what it is about in that concrete um, manner. So for me, outdoor education, I use bridging the gap because in education specifically, as I learned, there is this gap between what you're learning in class and then sort of how it's applicable in the real world and how instead of in school, you know, we go to English, we go to math, they're kind of in silos and they're separated. But then in the real world, science is history which is math, which is English, like they're all mixed in together in this complex world. And so my title was signifying that I think outdoor education is a way to bridge a lot of different gaps and situations um, in education and in the real world. So that was just the thinking behind mind. And then the second part of it was giving a more explicit, simple, concrete, to the point um, 
uh, information as to what it was actually about um, technically. So keep these things in mind, but certainly, you know, don't get overrun. I think simple is the best um, place to start. Um, do that first and then mix in some creativity, some fun, um, but don't, don't get too outlandish with it. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing I was gonna note, if I, if you don't mind, Sierra, uh, is the so the surprising factor. Um, it's really hard to impress some of these old fogies <laughs> that have been doing this for years and years and years. But still, they come to these conferences over and over again, and they learn. Um, so giving them new information and solid information, it is science. We are we are bridging the gap, so to speak. So, yeah. like, yeah. And I would, I would add to, I think, in my personal experience, science, academia, these, these settings um, are starting to have a different flavor to them. I think, you know, Gen Z, millennials, we want a little bit more creativity and life back in life. Um, even in the STEM fields, it doesn't have to be so cut and dry. And so I think your title is a fun way to throw some of that creativity in there um, and spark some interest and, and be a little more creative. So definitely utilize that. Um, it is gonna pull people in, especially um, folks who aren't technically aware um, or don't have that background. So giving them something to draw them in that's relatable is, is really important if you wanna reach a broader audience. And then just a quick note, um, it looks like Allie mentioned she, that she focused on her abstract um, on the methods and approach and then talked about expected results. Um, yes, I think that that's totally valid. We learned that in school, um, that if you don't have results, you would talk about what your hypothesis is, what you're expecting based on what you have done. Um, and then if you get to the end of your project and that changed, um, you just make note of that. Um, but I think that that's a valid way to go about it. Leslie, if you have any differing opinion you can share, but I think expected results is a good way to go if you don't have actual results. You yeah, know, I completely agree. It would be, you know, you can frame what your hypothesis is and what you predict the results to be absolutely in writing an abstract. If it's not, if you're still in kind of in progress, that's a totally acceptable thing to do. Yes, predicted, not expected. You shouldn't go into science expecting <laughs> to see anything, um, so language is important. But yes, um, so those are tips on a good title. Thank you so much, Sierra. Uh, okay, so we're gonna jump into our next segment, which is the more dense part, I guess you could say, what makes a great presentation. We'll talk about slides first, and then I'll kick it back to Sierra to talk about posters. But I'm gonna give uh, anybody an opportunity to ask questions about the function of a good title. I shared in the chat a YouTube link to Dr. Bruce Kershaw. He just did a ESA webinar on what makes a good title, or and also he's done other ones on what makes a good presentation. So um, it's a brief video. It's good to check out if you wanted to, and it talks a little bit more about the simple, um, concrete, the three words that I forgot already <laughs> on the previous slide. Uh, okay, so this is a question for you all as the audience. I feel like there's got to be some knowledge in the room besides what we're bringing to the table today. So what makes a great presentation? I'd like to see some responses in the chat box. So give you a moment to think about that, you know, but I'm talking about in particular the slides um, or the posters, like what makes a great presentation? Um, I'll give you a moment. No, I just hit you with an assignment, so. Somebody's got something, hopefully. <laughs> All right, catering to different learners. Absolutely, pictures, yes. Limited jargon or explained jargon, great visuals. Yes, informational, audience catching, good data visualization. I can't say that word. You know what I'm trying to say. Yes. Okay. I love it. All right. So I think we have a solid foundation for what makes a great presentation. So I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly, uh, but obviously ask questions as I go through if you need. But I like to do this. 
you know what a good presentation is. You just told me you know what it is. So let's talk about what bad examples are, right? <laughs> What's wrong with this picture here, folks? Tell me, tell me, what do you see? What's going on here? Why is this a no-no? <laughs> yeah, awful color scheme, neon contrast. It really just hurts the eyes in general. And then I'm not, I don't even think I'm visually impaired, but I really have to squint to read this, right? I got another one for you. What about this one? How about this one? What's going on here? What's wrong with this scene? You can't read it. That's right. It's a busy mess. <laughs> Megan, thank you for saying that. <laughs> that. Yes, absolutely. And how about this one? So this doesn't have contrast issues and it doesn't seem too busy. So what's the problem here? Right, no supporting visuals, too many words. So if I were to do this, are you going to listen to me during the presentation or are you going to be staring at the screen, trying to read every word that's on the screen? Right, exactly. And speaking of staring at screens, what's wrong with this picture here, right? I don't think I need to explain it too much, but obviously we don't want to stare at the screen, right? Yeah, these are real examples. Yes. Well, except for the last one, the one, the last one was. Okay, so we're going to talk about when making slides, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this stuff pretty quickly. Obviously, one we have to make a theme, right? So when you're when you're starting out your slide deck, you have to think about what do you want the look and feel of your slide deck to be, um, and then in addition to that, you want to use structures to build on ideas, right? You don't want to hit them all at once. You want to use a little bit of information at a time, and you want to keep building on that. You see this agenda slide multiple times, right? This is our way of saying, this is where you started, this is where you're going. You're building those structures and you're going through your slides. The next thing is you wanna be consistent. You wanna be consistent with your fonts. You wanna be consistent with your headers, the, the, the style of the fonts, the style of the headers, the color of your background, consistency matters. Um, and I just recently, every time I do one of these presentations, I try to do a little bit of review for myself so that I'm not just blowing on air at you guys. And I, I watched this TED Talk and I'll share the link with you later. But um, basically, this guy blew my mind when he was talking about fonts and header sizes. And he was like, you ever notice how everybody has like a larger header text and then smaller subheader text? He's like, but isn't the sub the subtext there supposed to be the more rich content? So why isn't that we're not making our presentations look like this instead of this? Why aren't we doing this? So that's just food for thought. That's something that I learned new in this journey to making this presentation for you all. And I thought I'd share the information with you. And I'm actually practicing when I'm preaching. So uh, another point is making graphs distinctly different. So we're all scientists in the rooms or we're aspiring scientists for that matter. And we know that we're most likely gonna have graphs in our talk. So what's wrong with this picture here, right? We've got a we've got a graph A, we've got a graph B. There's no title, there's no description, there's no axes labels. But also at first glance, you don't even really see the difference. I mean, maybe you do, but maybe you don't. And if you were to put these on two different slides, would you really even understand that you just looked at a different graph? So like making sure that your graphs are unique when the, the audience is looking at them to really help them understand the points that you're driving home. So we want to keep things simple. You can tell I'm not, there's not a lot going on here. It's just a few bullet points and I'm doing most of the talking because ultimately I am the presenter, um, but I'm using repetition to drive home my points so that you're seeing each of these uh, each of these bullets over and over and over again. Remember this, this isn't helpful. If we use this, nobody's ever gonna walk away learning things. So keeping things simple really makes the point um, clearer for folks. And the animation. Animation is your friend. So obviously I'm customizing my animation because I'm using up and down. I want your eye to follow where I am in the presentation. And I use the animation to help me so that you understand where I'm going. Um, and then contrast. We've already talked about contrast. Did that hurt your eyes? Is that bright? That was very bright for me, you know? And then this it seems so much simpler. It seems so much nicer. And I, what I'm trying to drive home is you can go for a white background and black text, or you can go for a black background and white text, but don't do them both. 
don't mix it up too much, you know, don't go crazy. You want the, the visual aid to be just that, an aid. You don't want it to make your brain hurt. So that's the content for uh, making slides. Obviously, this is not extensive, but I wanted to give you some baseline points. And if you think of anything, you're welcome to, to add or contribute to that. But for now, I'm going to kick it back over to Sierra, and we're going to let her talk a little bit about posters. Yeah, so we'll kind of go through. I didn't follow the tips. Everything is here for you to see because I just wanted to get through this in the time that we have. But if you have planned out time and you have more than, you know, five minutes, uh, definitely follow all of these tips and tricks. Um, so posters are a little bit different because you have one piece of paper and it's there and people are walking by and we want to draw them in and you may have a short time to talk about um, your whole entirety of your project that you spend months or a year on. And so with posters specifically, there really needs to be intention around what you're including, how you're putting it together and what you're presenting to your audience. Um, you still wanna ha have the main elements. Um, so your title, which for posters, the title is typically larger um, because that is what your audience will see at first glance and will give them an idea of, um, the best idea of what they're coming in to be in your space to learn about. So um, posters are a little bit different in that sense. You wanna have your title very visible um, for everyone to see so they know what they're getting into. Um, and then you wanna have your name and your like campus, if you're in school, your organization, your site, um, that lets them know your name right away and where you're coming from. Um, and then you have your core technical content, um, your abstract, a brief introduction, um, your methods, which typically in a poster are best to have them in like a flow chart or a way to summarize really quickly. And again, um, you may have non-technical STEM folks there. So the best way that you can get this content out that's relatable is going to do good on you. If they have any more, um, like specific questions, they'll ask and they'll come to you and you have that knowledge and then you can share. Um, results, never any raw data. I think that's a given, most folks know that. You wanna present your final um, figures, graphs. Uh, results are also best to present um, in a visual format. Again, you can explain should anybody have any questions about the x-axis, the y-axis, um, error bars, things that you use statistically, um, they can come to you for those questions if they don't understand. Um, you don't need to take up room on your poster. Um, and then your discussion. Your discussion needs to be concise, bullet points, um, just like in your abstract. Really, this is the section of your poster where you want to tie it into real world issues. Why is your research important? What does it give to the people who are showing up? Why does it matter to them? Um, because that's really going to drive a really rich discussion. Um, and in my opinion, it makes science, it makes these types of things feel good for everyday folks. And I think, at least in my mind, getting everyday folks into science in any way possible is great because then we're all invested in how we can do better. Um, so those are the two main points. And then really tiny, you can have your resources and your acknowledgements. Um, you know, you are citing information, likely it's likely that you're citing information. And so you do wanna make sure that you're having those resources on there, but they don't need to take up a lot of space. Um, that is just a, a formality. Uh, visuals, really important in your poster. Again, it's one page. People are just walking by. You want it to catch their attention. Uh, legible fonts. Uh, Times New Roman is my favorite. Um, Arial, just the really standard ones. Nothing fancy, no um, cursive. That can just be really confusing. Um, and then, so those are the main elements. Any questions about those? Okay, you can always pop in the chat. So the more creative fun part. So humans are visual creatures. Um, they like to look at things. So it's finding this balance between giving them something to look at, but not 
allowing them to get distracted or off of your talk and what you're saying. Um, yes, I know that some fonts are easy to read and also just present smaller. So sans serif um, might be a good one. Um, so the elements of visual hierarchy and uh, Jessica went over some of these, but the balance between negative and positive space. So negative space is going to be your background. Positive space is your foreground. You want to create a nice balance to where it's not boring, but people aren't overwhelmed. Um, which also ties into contrast that can be contrast of color or and contrast of visuals versus words. Um, again, Jessica mentioned it repetition, you want everything to be in this nice aesthetic um, package that has repetition of certain elements that make the poster flow really easily and look visually appealing. Um, proximity. Uh, we'll see this in my example, but things that are close together in our mind represent things that are related. So if you're making a poster and you stick your um, like methods really close to your discussion and people miss the results section, they may get confused. So be really intentional about how things are grouped because the human brain will automatically just connect those together. And then color. Um, color is important. Um, their warm colors make us feel excited, red, orange, and then those like cooler colors make us feel maybe more laid back. So even the color you put on your poster can present some type of energy or aura or feeling that you're trying to convey. So keep that in mind. I think we learned that neon was just, it was too much. It was, it was like, whoa. Um, and you don't wanna use too many colors. Again, it's, it's finding this really nice balance. And just like with anything, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the more you ask for feedback, um, the better you will get at it. And then there's this nice little visual hierarchy example that you can go through. Um, you read the first line and then you kind of miss the middle part. And then you have this bolded section at the end that kind of draws your attention in. So um, be careful what you bold, be careful of sizing. Again, all of this is really important to just what humans default when they're looking at things um, really quickly. And then we'll look at an example. Oh, we'll do the example after this. So these are some tips. Um, these are all resources that will be shared that you'll be able to look at. So um, there's a GSA white paper on how to make your posters stand out. Um, white papers are just kind of like tips and tricks on things and um, just really quick. It looks like anecdotes from past students. Um, on this one, past winners on how they designed, organized, and prepped for their poster presentation. So you're getting a firsthand um, account from winners. The next one is strategies for creating a conspicuous, effective, and memorable poster presentation. Um, GSA Today Groundwork article by JP um, and Phoebe L. So you can look at that resource. And then the last one is how to create a better research poster in less time. And it's a YouTube video that will discuss how to create um, a better poster using two different techniques. So those are resources that we will share. So yeah, this is actually uh, my work from my grad program. It is by no means a perfect poster. Um, and also recognizing that my grad program was social science based. Um, it was not hard science based. So while social sciences still follows the scientific method and still has an intro and methods and results, um, there's far less graphing. And so the visuals can be a challenge. So um, there are a lot of words. Um, that's probably one of the flaws of my poster. Um, but I just wanted to give an example. There are good things, there are bad things or things that could use improvement, not bad. Um, so one, it's a couple of colors. Um, it's not wild, it can maybe use one more color, but it's pretty aesthetically pleasing to look at. It's not hard on the eyes um, and you can see everything. Um, you have my title, which is, you know, bigger on the top. So if somebody is walking by, they know immediately this is about outdoor education. There's no confusion as to what this poster is about. Um, and then they know my name, 
and what school I'm coming from. And then um, it's broken up. So the things that go together are sectioned in a box on the whole poster. So you know that those things are related to each other. Um, and then it flows in a, um, this is a little bit of a confusing part, but it flows down and then up, which is not how we, in a, like in American culture typically read. Um, so that also maybe could use improvement. Um, and then I zoomed in on one. So again, I bolded the results so that folks knew those were the results. And then I used darker than the rest of the bulk of it, but not as dark as the title to indicate these two separate subsections under the results. And then I underlined um, the words, like keywords that were important. So this was my way of breaking it down to making it a little bit easier. Um, in this case, I did have a table that I could have included versus the wording. Um, so again, not perfect, uh, but I just wanted to highlight some of the um, things that I was mentioning. Um, so that was that. Was that, oh, sorry, I accidentally hit the button. Okay, we're good. All right, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, all right, so slides and posters, there's different strategies, folks. I mean, ultimately we are not the all knowing. Um, I know that there's examples of posters out there that don't even use intro methods, uh, abstract, the, the atypical thing that you would see in a scientific journal or publication, you know, we, as scientists, we have to constantly improve our science communication abilities. And there's other ways to say that, you know, like, why is it relevant? Takeaways. Um, but thank you so much, Sierra, for doing that. And then I'm going to shift to the last part, which is what makes a great presenter. You know, I like to make the audience do the work. So here we are. Here's the question again. Please add your response to the chat box. What do you think makes a great presenter? Um, everybody has a moment where they went and saw a presentation, whether it was a seminar, brown bag lunch, they went to a professional conference, what stood out? Why do you think that presenter was awesome? What was it? Someone is passionate. You went, you participated and had no guidelines, Sire Laura, it jumped past me, <laughs> come back to it. Engaging, passion, passionate, catering to your audience, speaking loudly and clearly, hand gestures, right? Okay. So I'm going to talk about what I think great presenters will do. You know, obviously, if I don't hit all the marks as I go through this, you are welcome to contribute. Um, first of all, know your audience. Oh. I jumped ahead. Know your audience, right? So uh, what does that mean? I mean, how do you really know your audience? Well, if you're going to a professional conference, say you're going to the Geological Society of America's conference, and you've been asked to submit your presentation into a certain subsection, and everybody in that room is going to be a, uh, a professional on that subsection, then you know you don't have to go to what are rocks, right? You don't have to start at the very baseline. You can start a little bit more in depth. It, it, I'm not saying they just do rock, but I'm an ecologist by training anyway. So yeah, so understanding who your audience is really helps to determine where your starting point is. And so if a presenter is talking to a community of elementary schoolers versus a professional scientist, obviously you're gonna change the way you talk. And I've been to presentations where they're like super high level and nobody knows what they're talking about. Tell a story. So I want to bring it back to Hannah Bonner because I think it's ironic that we coordinated this whole thing together and Hannah has an amazing story storytelling capability. She, in my mind, stood out as one of my favorite presentations from last year because she started her talk off about cyanobacteria. Nobody really knows about cyanobacteria, like baseline knowledge is very minimal, but she starts off with telling about this family dog who went for a swim in the Virgin River and then died. Now, does your story have to be tragic? Absolutely not, but I was hooked. You know, I'm a dog person. I was immediately listening because of that. Um, be, so be relatable and be authentic. Authenticity really resonates with audiences. You know, show them who you are, so to speak. And I know that that's not something that's easy. That's a practice strategy. Uh, 
yeah, storytelling is a great way to engage your audience and have them have a memorable moment there. But being relatable, being authentic, showing that you're passionate, all of these things. Yeah, dressing appropriately as well. Alex, I agree with you there. Considering accessibility, right? So this is a thing that I don't know why it's taken us so long to wrap our heads around as scientists, but we're really starting to get it now. And so we got to keep going with it, but right. So we want to make sure that people can hear us, not just the folks in the back, but maybe the people in front that have hard of hearing. They need to be able to hear us as well. We want those high contrast slides because we want people who are visually impaired to be able to see. And you can even go as far as, you know, printing out a copy of your script or your slides in advance, just like one or two and just having them there in case somebody needs access. Little jargon. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going crazy. All right, sorry. Uh, little jargon, little to no jargon, right? Everybody loved David Attenborough. Do you think David Attenborough knows everything about everything in the in nature? No, but he keeps it real. He has scientists telling him stuff, and then he sits there and conveys it in a way that like all of us can actually understand what he's talking about. Um, obviously, he's using wonderful visual aids the entire time, but it's obvious um, he is a very memorable speaker. Everybody knows who David Attenborough is. And if you don't, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll send you to Blue Planet or whatever one of those is. But yeah, little jargon. Or, you know, if you're in a room full of people that know your content, obviously you can throw some jargon in there, but it's helpful to maybe even have a glossary. And I've seen people do that in strategies before with slide making. If you're going to use a couple complex words, you throw a glossary slide in there and you might bring it up for that repetition sake to make them understand what it is. QR codes is a great way to have access. Yes, I agree with you there. And practice, right? So all the great presenters didn't just get good on their own, right? They practice and they practice and then they practice some more. So um, that's the what great presenters I think they'll do. Obviously I'm seeing some, some wonderful suggestions in the chat box to keep them going. And I'm gonna get to the speech part. So a lot of people struggle with this part and this is, this is who you are. You're the, you're now the presenter, right? So how do you do this? How do you how do you look at your audience? You know, it you have to look at them. You don't have to look at one person. You have to look at all of these people, right? You, and you, and then occasionally you look at your slides. But if you are looking at your slides, one, you're you're communicating that you don't know what you put in your presentation, and two, you're communicating some nerves there. So just making sure that you you look at your audience, but not only that, but engage them right? I want you to do the work here. I want you to be the active participant, the active listener. So ask a question, ask them why they're here today. What brought them to the talk? You know, you can ask them a question. I know it's very limited time, so you have to budget your time wisely. Don't overuse your clicker. So when I was in grad school, somebody gave me a clicker. That was my favorite tool. Okay, all of a sudden I had a laser in my hand, I could flip through slides, and I didn't realize that when I got nervous, and I still do it, you've seen it happen, I, I click too much, like I accidentally will go forward, or I'll use the laser pointer too much, and I'll be like, I'll look at my audience and I'll see that they got the wiggly cat eyes because they're following the laser beam, and they're not really following me. And on top of that, if you are nervous, you can bet that, that that little beam is gonna be wiggling hardcore on your slide. So just using it here and there, not too much. Um, the filler words thing is a reality that everybody does it. It's almost impossible to eliminate it. And the only way you're gonna get better at it is to practice it. I know there are some apps out there that actually will count your filler words nowadays, I think. So what are filler words, right? Who, who's, what's your favorite filler word? So recently I would say that the filler word I see the most is awesome. Okay, awesome, now let's get started. So that's a, that, that's a, at least a fun filler word, but then there's the more boring, boring ones like like is a filler word, um, okay. So just learn to let the silence happen. And that's something that I struggle with every time we do one of these presentations. Talking slowly, talking loudly, right? So what's the first thing we do when we do a presentation? We're practicing, we're speeding up, we're aware of the time. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna run out of time. I'm gonna talk so fast, nobody's gonna understand what I'm saying. So taking, taking a step back, I almost intentionally practice my talks at a really, 
ridiculously slow pace because I know I'm going to speed them up. So if I start off really slow, then maybe I'll be at that normal speed when I'm doing it in person. But also, we've already talked about accessibility and the importance of enunciating your words, the importance of speaking loudly and clearly so that people understand what you're saying, and then bringing the passion, bringing the emotion. You know, sometimes you can use the speed of your voice to get people excited. You can draw excitement in the room. She's been talking calmly this whole time, and then all of a sudden she's talking really fast, passionately. And then you're getting that this is a moment, this is the climax, so to speak, of the presentation. Or she's talking really slowly because it's a graph and it's it's kind of hard to process and you want to make sure you have time to process. And breathing. I forget to breathe. <laughs> like that was one of the things that happened to me a lot with confidence. You get up in front of a stage and all of a sudden, like, I feel like I'm going to pass out. And I don't know why. Like, it was even worse for me on webinars. I think it's because I could stare at myself and it's like looking in the mirror. I never even practiced in front of a mirror. But yeah, breathing, learning to breathe, learning to control your breath and learning to talk like at a normal pace is only gonna happen with lots and lots of practice. So that's it. Those are the speech parts that I have recommendations for. Um, and then the last thing that I'm gonna kind of leave off with is that ultimately, whether or not you're building a poster or a slide deck, and no matter how amazing they are, you are the presentation. If you are not mentally preparing yourself to be the presenter, to, to make the presentation, to say the work that you've done, because it's your work, nobody knows it better than you. And you have to remember that that is the, the fact of the matter. Nobody knows this content better than you, except for maybe if you had like somebody over your shoulder the whole time. But in reality, even then, they're not over your shoulder the whole time. The PowerPoint or the Prezi or the Canva or the poster or whatever it is, is purely a visual aid to assist you in being the presentation. So just remember that, utilize that, and I will leave you all to open for q and I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I want to see some faces. Hopefully, you have some questions. And if you didn't, I'm just going to assume that I had a knockout presentation. Leslie, Sierra, and I all crushed it, and you had nothing left. But I hope you do. <laughs> so um, yeah, any questions? I'm going to pause and take a sip of water. Thanks for the high fives, y'all. Well, maybe this. I'm going to call out some of my PhD students that I know are in the crowd. I know you've done some presentations before. How did you get over nerves? How did you find your inner strength, your inner presenter? Sophia, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute. Um, hi, I'm not a grad student, but I do have a question. Um, so I guess I was going back to like writing a title. Um, in a situation where you're doing a presentation on something that's like really technical or really specific, or maybe like just like really narrow, like how do you balance having like an engaging title while still staying within the scope of your project? Yeah, if you don't mind me asking just for the sake of practice, because I'm better with like real life stuff. <laughs> um, like, what is your work on? Um, well, I'm just thinking I did a poster a couple months ago on um, remote sensing in a forest in um, Oaxaca, Mexico. And I just like, my project was really technical and really specific. Um, yeah. And I didn't want to come up with a title that outsized the implications of the project that I was doing. Um, yeah. And finding that balance was something that I really struggled with. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to say, and I think everyone feels differently about it. If you're like at, and I think like context is really important. So always keeping that in mind, if you're at a conference, that's just like very rigid and like is a place that has yet to sort of like, I think move in this direction of, of having a bit more creativity in STEM, like 
definitely just present your title as they wish it to be and what makes sense for that conference because you know i think there are varying types of what's okay and what's not for the one that i took part in it was very much like more touchy feely i would say or like removing those especially in STEM, like Western ways of viewing science, which are very narrow and very rigid. And so I was able to sort of step outside of that. So I think it depends on where you're at, but I think it's just taking something, maybe like a comparison or something that's really cool in your research that's not as technical or like, you know, just asking the question, like, do trees talk to each other or what are trees thinking? You know, like something that like, brings to life because I also think in STEM you know we tend to view these like non-human things as not living or not having ways of expressing themselves so I think just finding a way to like bring these things to light and shed more of a like social aspect on what you're doing and then sharing the technical side of it and the rest of the title is my my own personal thought I like to start with something a little bit more accessible for everybody and that's kind of fun and gets your brain moving and then share the rest of it so I, yeah I think context is important and then what can you pull out that you found really interesting or that's cool or a different way of looking at it that's not as technical if that makes sense yeah, thank you. Maybe you say when uh, we don't know if trees talk. <laughs> uh, Alexis, go ahead, unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, okay, so a quick question, but I was wondering if you have any tips on how to present on a panel. Like, is any of those skills kind of like transferable to this presentation or is that like a whole different ball game? Leslie, you wanna say anything about panel presentations? You know, I think this is a good question and one that I haven't gotten before, so I'm answering it for the first time. Um, but I would say that uh, one of the really cool things about a panel is that you've got expertise from different points of view all around you. And so, um, one thing that I would maybe look at, if, if you know the composition of the panel that you're speaking on, for example, is to look who's in the room and what your, your unique, um, what your unique uh, ideas and uh, contributions might be and kind of focus on those to kind of tailor uh, your introduction to yourself and what you, what you might be able to speak to um, in, 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 in the context of kind of increasing the panel's variety of and uh, and uh, richness of information that you might be able to share. Um, so I would focus on, I guess, like, yeah, your unique selling points and things that you're really confident about speaking to play off the comments of your, your panel presenters that you're working with and try to just build off uh, of each other in terms of your knowledge base and what you're sharing with the audience. Um, and it's also helpful, I think, panels, uh, or the reason that I've seen people like to attend panels in the past is that there is that diversity of opinion and perspective. So always be, um, ne never be afraid to share what you think if it's in contrast to one of the panel presenters and the comments that they've made because your perspective matters and it's probably gonna be very valuable to the audience members to hear. Um, and I'll stop there and actually ask if anybody else has other ideas about panel presentations. I, I, I really liked Leslie's point about not being afraid to contrast with what other panelists might say. I think that actually adds interest to the discussion. If everyone's just agreeing and saying the same thing, then that sort of defeats the purpose of a panel. Um, and somebody had mentioned in, in the chat, um, I'm gonna portray it correctly, about being, um, have like anxiety about public speaking. So and I do not love public speaking but I find being in a panel environment, it's comforting and it's an easier environment in which to, in which to speak, um, for me at least. So if you're somebody that has uh, some anxiety and trepidation about speaking, I would definitely suggest participating in as many panels as you can uh, because, because you've got strength in, in numbers and you also get to learn from your fellow panelists. Um, the one last tip, quick tip I'd mention about being in a panel is being very mindful of the other panelists. 
and just making sure that you aren't you know, using up all the time. And also on the other hand, not selling yourself short and letting everyone else do the talking. So make sure that, that you um, provide your expertise as well, kind of hearkening back to some of what Leslie was saying. And uh, I'll stop there and see if any others have any comments. And I also see a hand is up. Yeah, that was, that was great. Um, I'm not, you all did it. I don't need to say anything other than maybe just, I put it in the chat. So just read the chat. So we're almost at time. Maya, I'm gonna definitely let you answer your question. I just wanna be respectful to the, the guest hosts that are here today. Are you all okay with just hanging back for a couple more minutes? Cool, awesome. Maya, go ahead. Hi, sorry. Um... I, I was just wondering, this is kind of on a different vein, but do you have any tips for looking for funding to go to conferences or like trying to balance wanting to go to all the conferences and having enough resource to attend them um, and like ways to attend if you don't have a ton of money? <laughs> So that is a good question. I know that GSA definitely has some travel awards that you can apply to. Um, and ESA is, so GSA and ESA, we're both working with the scientists and parks administrators to hopefully uh, establish a travel award um, way to get interns to these opportunities. It wouldn't be fully encompassing, but um, certainly uh, we're hoping to have at least a little bit of the funds covered but it's really just understanding the organization where you're trying to present, right? So like signing up for their listservs, getting, getting that information that comes out that normally goes straight to your junk box. You, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're checking that regularly because there's going to be a lots of information and it comes from different sources. So it's just important to monitor that. And Matt, maybe you want to talk, or Leslie, you want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, from your perspective, but. Sure, um, well, sometimes like professional meetings, they're, they're aware that you're traveling in it, in it and you're kind of investing in that travel. And so they try to build some resource for, resources for you to try to make that a little bit easier. And um, I know that GSA, they offer a, a rooms and rides community forum for people who are attending the meeting where you can actually connect with people to share like a hotel room cost, for example, or you might be able to book travel, traveling to the, the um, event site uh, where maybe you're sharing a ride or just coordinating travel to reduce costs that way. So that's something that can help save on just the aspects of getting to and from the meeting. Um, and then I really liked your comments, Jessica, about looking for travel grants um, through the professional societies you might be presenting with as well, or associated societies that you might you might be associated with and have money to go to other conferences. Because um, if you're, especially if you're a student, there's a lot of programs to apply for for grant funding, um, where you might be able to subsidize any costs that you have for attending the meeting. Um, and then um, one thing that we we do for uh, students, if you're you're a, a student um, with us, you can apply um, through a volunteer program to work a certain set of hours during the actual professional conference and kind of get an insider's view into the mechanics of the meeting and help out with that. And then uh, we offer complimentary registration for your efforts in volunteering. And so there's sometimes volunteer pathways to offset registration costs that could be available to students and um, might be worth asking about if you don't see them on the website. Thanks, Leslie. And I see uh, Megan drove, uh, also brought up a good point, which is that sometimes there's academic support. So like wherever you're going to school, if you're working in their labs, sometimes those professors, they're routinely going to the same conference every year and they'll support um, the in some way the student to come. And I've had experience with that as well. Ultimately, you have to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out which conference to attend, what best fits your long-term goals um, because if you're a student and you're really passionate about geology and all of the research projects you're doing are directly related to that, then GSA may be your home versus whether or not you're doing something more ecologically focused. And you, you know, each, each professional society has lots of different sections, you know, where people conglomerate together on a, a particular discipline, you know, so like ESA has like a botany section or something like that. So obviously you would want to try to present at a professional conference 
that directly is associated with the professionals you're hoping to network with and make lasting impressions. That's something else that will help drive the decision making, you know, in addition to affordability. Obviously, money talks. <laughs> so, okay, that's it. Uh, we're over time. I hope I got to everybody's questions. I want to say thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Leslie, Matt, Sierra, for your support in doing this presentation. And thank you all, SIP participants. I hope to see you at the Alumni Mixer. Um, and hope to see you at ESA or GSA. You know, it's a wonderful opportunity. Thanks for attending. Take care. Have a great week, the rest of your week. And if I could ask the guests, the hosts, to just hang with me for like two more minutes as everybody exits, just to do a quick recap, and I would appreciate that. <laughs>